Hi everyone. Thank you so very much for being here today with me. We are going to jump right into a video. And while you're watching this video, I'd like you to think about how much you know about this place. And afterwards, I'd like to share something very special that Brother Kinman made for me many years ago. Take a peek at the video now. Temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are some of the most interesting buildings in the world. Their unique appearance and well-kept grounds attract visitors from all walks of life. But the temple has special meaning to members of the church. For us, the temple is more than just a beautiful building. It's the most sacred place of worship on earth. It's a place of peace and inspiration. A place to feel closer to God and Jesus Christ. A place where family relationships are strengthened. A place where marriages and other special ceremonies are performed. A place to seek answers to life's challenges. To us, the temple is the house of the Lord. How did you feel when you watched that video? Oh, the temple is a beautiful place. Do you remember I said I'd like to share something with you that Brother Kinman made for me a long time ago? Here it is. Turn it around so you can see it. It's a picture of the temple. It's an origami making of the temple. And down at the bottom, two little people that's supposed to represent Brother Kidman and me. This was right after we were married in the temple. And we decided that we wanted to be able to remember the temple and all the wonderful things that happened inside. So he made this for me for a gift and we've had it on the wall. I'm going to put it over here just to keep it propped up so you can see it in the background. So have you ever been to a temple before? Have you ever seen a temple in person? Let me show you a couple pictures here. Here's a picture of Allie, my daughter Allie, when she was a little girl. She's standing in front of the temple. And here's a very similar picture. You see the background. Here's her brother, Logan. So we decided we would take a trip to the temple, even though Logan and Allie weren't old enough to go inside the temple, they wanted to see the temple. And we packed a little picnic lunch and we went to a park before we went to the temple. And we had a little lunch and we talked about things that happened inside the temple. And then we drove up and we walked all on the outside of the temple. And did you see, look, the really pretty flowers. Temples always are so, such beautiful places on the outside. And we were able to feel some goodness by being just outside the temple. The spirit was there. Did you notice the name from the video that is on each temple? The house of the Lord. Holiness to the Lord. So whose house is it? It's Jesus Christ's house. It's the Lord's house. Maybe you and your family could take a trip to the temple sometime and just walk around its grounds and really look at the temple and think about how it makes you feel. Have a conversation about the special things that happen within the side of the temple and special things in there that help make your family grow closer and grow closer to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. So I'd like to read a scripture. It comes from Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, verse 32. And this is what it says. But my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved. Do you think the temple is a holy place? It sure is. It's a place where we grow closer to Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. Now, there was a word here that you may not know, and I'd like to talk about that for a moment. It's the word disciples. It says, but my disciples shall stand in holy places. Who do you think are disciples? You and me. 
disciples are any people that choose to follow Jesus Christ. So, we are to stand in holy places and shall not be moved. So, we talked about the temple being a holy place. Do you think that means that we just go to the temple and we stand very still and we're not moving? That's not necessarily what that means. When you stand in a holy place and you're not moved, that means you're standing your ground for the things in which you believe in. Um, do you know what else is considered a holy place? I'm going to read about it next from the Bible Dictionary. So I'm going to read what it says in the Bible Dictionary about a temple. And while you're listening, think if you can find the comparison of what the temple is like in sacredness. Okay? It says, a temple is literally a house of the Lord, a holy sanctuary in which sacred ceremonies and ordinances of the gospel are performed by for the living and also in behalf of the dead, for those that have passed away. A place where the Lord may come. It is the most holy of any place of worship on earth. Okay, here's the important sentence. Here's your clue. Only the home can compare with the temple in sacredness. So only the home can compare in being a holy place to that of the temple. Do you think your home is a holy place? What kinds of things make a home a holy place? Well, are you able to feel the spirit in your home? That it's a holy place. We can certainly do things within our homes to make it more holy. A few weeks ago, we talked about families, and we talked about how um, relationships within our families can help us grow closer together and grow closer to Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about this. If the Savior were to knock on your door, would he feel welcome? Would the Savior be able to feel the Spirit within your home? I know in our home, we're able to feel the Spirit more times than others. Um, one time that we're able to feel the Spirit is when we're studying the scriptures together, or when we're saying our prayers together. Um, recently, we've been able to hold sacrament in our home which is a very sacred ordinance. And that's brought a lot of um, joy to our home and the spirit into our home. When we're kind to one another, that certainly brings a holiness into our home. Um, I remember my daughter, Allie. She was, she was little. She was probably primary age. And she loved to do lots of arts and crafts and things like that. So she had a lot of supplies. And she would go into her room and she'd make a huge mess. Things would be all over the place. And one day she came to me and she said, Mom, my room doesn't feel very good. And I thought that was an interesting way to word it. Because I know I could take a peek inside and it didn't look very clean. But she said it didn't feel very good to her. So we talked about what are some of the things that she could do to help it feel better. She said, I think I need to clean up my messes. So little by little, she'd tackle a little bit in her room and she'd get things cleaned up. And she was finally able to say that it felt good. So one thing that I notice about the temple when we go is everything is very clean and everything is very tidy. So. I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, we don't have to live in a fancy house to be able to have it clean and tidy, do we? No. So things like that can help us to have a holy home too. Um, when I was thinking about Jesus Christ, it reminded me of going to church. And I thought, is that a holy place? It sure is. The temple is a holy place. Our homes are holy places. 
going to church, those are holy places. But are there any other places that can be holy places? Do you remember the scripture that said, stand ye in holy places? Well, are the only places that we go the temple and church and our homes? No, we go all sorts of places. So wherever we go and the things that we do wherever we go that are able to invite the Spirit, and if we think Jesus Christ would be able to stand right beside us and be pleased, those become holy places. So think about that this week as you go out and about and do your, your everyday activities. Find ways for those places to be holy places too. We're going to close with a video. As you watch this video and listen to the beautiful song, I want you to think about how it makes you feel. Think if you are able to feel the spirit while you're watching the video. I know I've watched it many, many times, and I do tear up a little bit each time just because I do feel the spirit. Now there's a word in the song that might be um, unfamiliar to you. The word is nigh. You're going to hear that many times. Nigh just means very close or right beside. So when they talk about the Savior being nigh, that means the Savior is close by. So enjoy the video, think about how you feel, and then we'll close with a testimony. If the Savior stood beside me, would I do the things I do? Would I think of His commandments and try harder to be true? Would I follow His example? Would I live more righteously if I could see? Standing nigh, watching over me. If the Savior stood beside me, would I say the things I say? Would my words be true and kind if He were never far away? Would I try to share the gospel? Would I speak more reverently if I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me? Beside me, would I often kneel to pray? Would I listen to the Spirit's voice and hasten to obey? Would I count my many blessings? Would I praise Him gratefully if I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over? If the Savior stood beside me, would I comfort those in need? Would I try to show the Savior's love in every word and deed? Would I give to those who hunger? Would I serve more willingly if I could see? Savior standing nigh, watching over me. He is always near me, though I do not see him there. 
And because he loves me dearly, I am in his watchful care. So I'll be the kind of person that I know I'd like to be if I could see the Savior standing nigh. If I could see the Savior standing nigh, watching over me. Wasn't that a beautiful song? Weren't those amazing pictures of Jesus Christ? Oh, it made me feel so good. Maybe you'd like to watch it again after this video is finished, just like I have. Boys and girls, I'd like to share my testimony with you that I know when we stand at holy places, when we stand wherever the Savior would want us to stand, and do the things that the Savior would want us to do, that they will feel holy to us. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bye-bye, boys and girls. See you another time. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Primary Music. Um, I'm going to be introducing a new song that we're going to learn this month. Um, but first, I want to share a couple stories. So the first story is about the early saints. Um, the, er the early saints who we're going to be learning about in the Doctrine and Covenants this month. Um, a lot of them were asked, the early saints were asked to move to Ohio and to other places. Um, and when they did, some of them had to sell a lot of their stuff. And when they got to Ohio, they didn't have um, everything that they needed. And because of that, Heavenly Father asked the other saints, the other people who had enough, to share with those who didn't have enough. Um, and of course, we are all asked to share um, and help each other out when we can. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, there are many different ways to share what, we're, what we have. And I'm going to share a story about a woman who uh, was able to share of her time and of her um, knowledge and her talents that she had with others um, to help women around her. And this, this story, it's from my book again, um, and it's like probably my favorite story in the book, so get excited. This is, her name is Elias Ship, the determined doctor, and she lived, um, oops, she was, <laughs> A, um, a woman who lived in Utah during the time that Brigham Young was a prophet. So, Ellis was a determined woman settling the Utah Territory in 1860s and her husband wanted to have a family. She gave birth to 10 children, but only six of them survived. Many babies died during childbirth because there was not enough skilled doctors and midwives to care for them. The death of so many children devastated Ellis. So that would have been really, really hard um, to, be, to see so many babies dying. Here's her doctor bag here. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of babies died because there weren't enough doctors and midwives to help them. So Ellis had a choice to make. She could mourn that too many babies were dying, or she could do something to solve the problem. Right. Ellis chose to make things better. She knew that childbirth was a gift from God, and she was determined to make it safer. Encouraging, encouraged by her family and the prophet Brigham Young, Ellis moved all the way across the country to attend medical school. She became pregnant during her studies, but that did not deter her. 
Ellis prayed that she would still be able to complete her studies and gave birth on the day after her exams. Can you imagine that? She had tests and then the next day she had a baby. Ellis became one of the first female doctors in Utah, but she knew that one doctor couldn't solve such a big problem, the big problem of so many babies dying. So Dr. Ellis started a nursing school in Salt Lake City and taught more than 500 midwives to safely deliver babies. Ellis was set apart by the apostles to be a midwife. That means that they basically gave her calling um, and blessed her and said, this is your calling, you're gonna be a midwife. Um, and that's what she did. So Ellis was set apart by the apostles to be a midwife and she used both her school knowledge and her spiritual knowledge to strengthen women in labor. During her 50 years as a doctor and midwife, Ellis welcomed over 5,000 babies into the world. Balancing medicine and motherhood, she cared for her own family while saving lives in her community. There's another picture there. So, um, I love this story because I think it's amazing how um, Ellis saw a problem and she saw so many people suffering and so many babies dying. Um, and she chose to do something about it and she chose to move her whole family across the country and um, went to school at a time when not a lot of women went to school, especially to become doctors. Um, and then when she came back to Utah, she used all of the knowledge that she had to make childbirth safer for women and to save a bunch of babies um, with her knowledge that she got from school. And not only that, but she also spent a lot of time helping other women to learn all of the things that she learned from school. So she really devoted her life to helping others and to doing good. Um, and I'll also add that I have a midwife who is gonna deliver my baby um, in May. So that's like in about four weeks from now. Um, and my midwife happens to belong to our church and she's gonna come to my home and um, help my baby to be safe. And I'm so grateful that we have such a rich legacy of, um, of women delivering babies from uh, in our church. All right, <clears throat> so um, the song that we're gonna be learning this uh, month is called Have I Done Any Good? Um, and it's a song about helping others and um, sharing what we have, whether that is um, your time or your things um, with other people. So just like the early saints um, shared what they had with each other so that they would all have what they needed, and just like Ellis Ship shared her um, talents and her time with others to make a difference and to do good in the world, um, we are asked to do good in the world um, in different ways that we can. Um, so while you listen to the song, I want you to think about different ways that other people have helped you and shared with you. And then also think about ways that you can help others or different stories that, um, where you have helped others like at school or at home. Um, so yeah, so just think about those things and those examples and um, I will see you guys next month.